today we have Dean Delisle with us. He is the founder and CEO of a social media and influencer agency in Chicago. He helps professionals and organizations build digital thought, leadership, and influence to help them get found and be known so that they generate more revenue. He's been featured in the news on Fox, NBC, CBS, ABC, and other news outlets as well. One thing you might not know about our presenter is that he has a new book on Amazon and brought a few with him here today. Today's here to share eight steps to build your digital influence business. Please give a warm dream make welcome to Dean Delisle. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. It was, uh, it was a good drive up from Chicago yesterday. I got to drive through a little bit of snow, but that's expected up here. I'm from the Midwest. It's all good. And do we have any Badgers fans in the audience? Do you, any Purdue fans? Oh. We have a big game tonight. So, Chris, we'll talk about that bet over lunch. So, I just want to thank you. I've done a lot of events up here, probably the last seven or eight years. One of my favorite uh, cities to visit. It's a super clean city, it's filled with innovation, great businesses. I just hear all kinds of cool things. And now, this uh, new location. Spark is really what it says. It's about helping people ignite uh, themselves to that next level. So super cool. So uh, as part of this, can everybody jump like this? No, it's not. Um, this is about, I'm going to talk today about helping you get found, to be known. You know, when we start off in business, and I've had uh, about 11 companies, 11 or 12 companies, and count four of those were successful. So you think about what we do as business owners when we're starting things out and we're doing things. But one thing is once our name for our business or ourselves is known and now with online we can be found, it really helps take us to that next level. So even if we pivot or we shift or, or we decide to change, it's the power of ourselves, our brand, and our network. If we're always in control of that, we can always take it to that next level. And so we have eight steps that we go through, and so we're going to talk through those today. Now, a couple, uh, most of these things were mentioned, so I'm going to mention uh, who remembers their first job, right? So anybody's first job, was it in hospitality, busing tables ever? So I started off, uh, and we were talking about this before the show, it's like, uh, did you have a degree in technology? And I'm like, no, I was in hospitality. So what's interesting is when I got my job in hospitality, uh, busing tables and things like that, it was a business restaurant. Um, and so all the people that gathered there were either business people or politicians. And at an early age, uh, you think about it, I was 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way into college, I was around networking, the original networking of doing deals over lunch, deals over dinner. I saw regulars, and I really got that as part of my wiring and my blood. Uh, when I was a, a, a sophomore in college, Purdue, um, I literally uh, met the CEO for Merrill Lynch, and I helped him cater some parties. And this is when computers were just getting popular, people were starting to get computer science degrees, uh, and this was in 1982. How many people remember 82 besides me? Thank you for acknowledging that. A lot of young people here. So in that, um, Mr. Bradley was building out for Merrill Lynch the Board of Trade. He was the CEO uh, of Chicago. So what I asked is, it was late night after one of his parties, and I, and I had really been getting into computers at school. I said, Mr. Bradley, what would it take for me to work at Merrill Lynch on all those computers that you guys are working on at the Board of Trade? He said, Dean, I like you. You're a hard worker. I trust you. You can start in two weeks. And that's how I got into technology. So think about that. Think about when we're starting a business, how hard we work and how often maybe we don't ask. So I'm going to talk today about making sure that you include yourself as part of the equation as you're building and growing. So in this, we look at not just thought leadership, but business influences. How do we monetize? 
So there's two areas that we service. We either help people service or we teach people. So I'm giving everybody that's listening and that has access a uh, free subscription to Social Jack, which has been around since 2012. And there's hundreds of free courses on how to build influence on multiple platforms. So if you just you know, go to socialjack.com, you'll see that there. Well, let's talk about some components. So first, how many people in here are sole practitioners? Online, you can chat as well. So a few. How many people have at least five people in the organization? Ten people? Four. Okay. So what we do is we look at who are the fans of the brand. So what's interesting is as we evolve or develop, we have um, different levels of people that are, are doing their job, and then at some point, we ask them to maybe go online and become fans of the brand. So we actually look at what are the opportunities here and who are the thought leaders and influencers that it would make sense to have them participate. Now we also have outside influencers. This could be customers. We've known about testimonials for decades, things like that. People that were vouch for us from the outside. And as I'm talking through the steps today, I want you to think about who are the people that are advocates or influencers around your brand, around your business, that you may not be thinking about to activate. And then we have content, right? Relevant content that the target audience wants to consume. So what we do is when we're building out a campaign to actually build influence for the brand or the person, we're looking at who's consuming, who's the target that's consuming the content, where do they consume it, what kind of content. Some might be more prone to video, audio, uh, infographics, it, it all depends, blogs, you name it. So we look at those three components, biggest, biggest part. And then we take them through a plan, a process. First, we have a plan. In the plan, we determine what are the platforms, who is the target, what are their personas. We're not gonna dig super deep on this, but you wanna just sort of write out a plan. Second is who are the advocates or the influencers that could help, that wanna participate. So I've known Chris Rudolph for years and, and we've been uh, influencer buddies on social media. So when he puts stuff up there, I help him, you know, engage. Even when I, you know, when I when I'm not thinking about, I'll be like, oh, I got to help Chris, and Chris does the same thing for me. So he's one of my influencers out there, where we partner and share content together. So think about the influencers that you have that you may not be maybe consciously enabling around that process. We look at thought leadership content. How can we provide content, whether it's original content or it's shared content, that our target people are consuming? So think about that. And there's all kinds of easy, free ways to, to dial into this. I use Google Alerts. Does anybody use Google Alerts? It's free. You basically can type any keyword phrase in there, and they will alert you daily or weekly on current news. So for us, it's thought leadership business influence, social media marketing, content marketing, whenever that's in the news, we are fed that news and I can determine what I wanna share with my audience. And then what I can do is I can look on other platforms to see the level of consumption. So we have content, obviously get some sort of maybe training or coaching before you go to launch. And then there's content distribution and management. There's uh, Hootsuite, there's Sprinkler. Shout out what you're using for social media distribution. Hootsuite, what else? Hootsuite. Social reports, another good one. And then make sure to measure, adjust, and continue. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig into some of the uh, uh, eight steps to sort of get out of the gate with this. So first in social media, it's busy. It is busy. So if you think about it, you know, think about the fact that if you just try to master one platform, how many people does Facebook have on it now? Over a billion? It's pretty crazy. LinkedIn just hit what, 750 million, like legit users? 
it's almost like people go back to Twitter just because there's less people. You know, it's like, you know, go figure. You know, it's like, it's not as noisy. It's not as hard to, to, to start conversations. Well, it's our choice, no matter what the platform is, of how we determine how do we approach it. Where do our people get? So I don't want you to think about everyone. I want you to think about just the people that are closest to you and your brand. Start small. Start with the smallest group around you and work your way out to build that community to you. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're starting with a small, we call that a social team. So actually just put that together. And if you Google social team, we have instructions and worksheets on, on how to build that. Let's go through some stats. So my best thing, uh, what I like is brand messages have reached 561% further when shared by employees and or influencers. So if you think about the impact, and, and this goes all the way down to sales, the evidence is out there that if we have humans, people trust people. So if we have humans that are willing to participate and share in our content, we have so much easier time and lower cost of driving people back to our brand. It's proven time and time again. So, so remember, include other people. It's that social team around you to help build the influence. A couple of quick definitions. Community marketing has been around forever. I used to do radio, billboard, television, magazines, you name it. Park benches, they don't let you put ads on park benches here, I know. It's just Chicago. <laughs> Taxi cabs, <laughs> you name it, they find places to put, to allow you to put advertising. Well, digital, it's everywhere. And so I own an agency, and when we look at the marketing numbers or the cost of acquisition with people and without people involved, multiple people, the cost is crazy different. So think about that. So if you have the opportunity to build a community and actually involve people, leverage your content and social media platforms at a smaller scale, you actually build community faster. So thought leadership. Forbes says a thought leader is an individual or firm uh, that prospects, clients, referral sources, and intermediaries, even competitors recognize as a foremost authority. They see you as an authority, that you know what you're talking about. And then when they begin to listen and act is when you cross over to business influencer. So when you ask for people uh, to buy your product or download something or to take an action and they start listening to you, you're an influencer. Now you may not be where you wanna to get to, you may not be monetizing it completely, but I want you to recognize when you put something out and even if you ask people to read your blog, and you begin to get just even a little bit of attraction there, pay attention. How are you asking? Who's showing up? Make sure you pay attention to those people. That's your community building on the spot. Make sure you acknowledge that. Now part two is a thought leader is an individual or a firm that significantly profits. Now originally in thought leadership in corporate, we were never allowed to associate thought leadership with profit. It's about brand credibility. In fact, on my LinkedIn, I just wrote an article on digital footprint. It was like this big known, oh, don't, don't mix up money with thought leadership. It's not supposed to be related. That's BS. Forbes even defines it as profitable. You're profiting off the fact that people are listening to you, that you're an authority. Okay, so that's okay. So any of you that are reserved about that, just know it's okay. So let's get into the eight steps. First and foremost, business goals. So we have goals for individuals and we have goals for the brand. So if we think about the brand, uh, most people come to us and go, we have a budget, we wanna be known as thought leaders. And we deal with some big, big, big brands and we also deal with small brands, and it's the same thing. Thought leadership is how you define, how you want to be perceived as an authority. 
So if that means that you want to be known for this thing, this thing, this thing, then those are how you want to attach your name. Whatever that is, you define it. But set a goal now to measure that not only are you going to define to be an authority, are people listening to you, and are they going to be able to follow your call to action related to it? So you want to know that you can get found. One of the easiest things that we tell people that are starting out is look at your social media. Look at your audience. People go, that one of the first things we look at is they say, uh, I can't get, uh, I can't really get engagement. You know, everybody wants engagement. And so I'll look at the product or the service, we'll look at the company, and then we'll look at the audience and I'm like, it's a total mismatch. The people in your audience are probably there because they're your friends or they're somebody that you originally started off with, but now your business is different. So the first thing you need to do is you need to inform the people that you want to target, and this could be an email list or whatever, that you exist, and this is how you exist, and this is the value that you provide. Thought leadership, business influence is all about value. Uh, and then you want to get to that part about being known. So um, again, I'm going to pick on Chris Rudolph because he's in the audience, but he's known as the marketing coach. So if you have a marketing business and you're a marketer, and you want to really get your act together as a small marketing firm, he's your person. So whenever somebody comes to me, Chris is the first person I think of. So when people come to people within your network for what you do, are you the first one they go to? Are you first? Or are you in a handful of three people? Four people? Or are you not mentioned? And this is for you or your brand. And sometimes it's as easy as informing the people around us and in our network of what we do. I struggled with this as an agency. There were a number of years when I would see Chris six, seven, eight years ago, what are you doing now? And it'd be like the same thing I was doing, oh, and this and this and this, because as an agency, sometimes we have to do multiple things. And you notice on the intro, and I was waiting for your comment on this. It says social media and influencer agency. It doesn't talk about websites, pay-per-click, anything else. That's what we're known for. But it took us a while to dial that in and get there. So make sure it's easy. If you want to be known and you want to be the first one people call, make it easy to understand, easy to consume. Make sure that's really important. And then increasing referrals and generate business. So what's interesting is if you look at the personal, there's some things that vary, but at the end of the day, we want referrals. We want business to cost less to acquire. Lowest cost of acquisition, CAC. It's a marketing term marketers use to measure the cost for acquiring a customer. You want that to be the least amount of effort, the easiest to do, and really the best, best customers coming through. The other way to measure too is to think about when you're looking at referrals or leads or people that are filling out your website or even going to your LinkedIn profile. Is that who you want to do business with? That is the best clue in the world. You look at the traffic on your website, the leads that you get, the referrals people are giving you. Is that what you want to be known for? Is that your core competency? So often, people are like, I got 20 leads, I got five referrals. Start to break them down and none of them are closing. They're the wrong people. So think about that measurement for yourself. First thing, business goals. So here's some other things if you want to take a quick snapshot of the screen of how people measure to get to the referrals, the appointments, the new pipeline, we call it, to get things into the sales pipeline. And of course, we want to increase business revenue. So these are some of the marketing measures. Okay, let's go to the awareness check. So I love this part. Oh, this is this uh, article I just wrote on digital footprint. So what's interesting is, you know, uh, I think I mentioned um, your name again. 
Yeah, so I think I mentioned that I started off in the reputation management business. Because I saw all this stuff on the internet, I had kids that were growing up, and I heard from some friends, my son didn't get admitted into this university because of something that happened online. And this was over a decade ago. And I'm like, well, somebody needs to help people understand that their digital footprint is critical. And now, even more today, look at how much we've put on the internet with our name attached to it. And are we checking it? Are we checking on behalf of our employees, us, ourselves, our brand, things associated with our brand? I've had people that use our company name Forward Progress or even Social Jack taken that name and applied it to something similar that was a whole different company trying to take from our energy and shift our business. Copycats. Somebody just taking your good name or your good brand and copying you. If you don't check, you won't know. So what we say is we say, Google yourself and look three pages deep. Three pages deep on every employee, even your customers, the people in your network, trusted advisors, your accountant, your attorney, anybody that's associated with the business. Now, I grew up a little more on the streets of Chicago a little bit. Um, so did you ever have your mom say, I don't think you should be hanging out with that person, right? That person's bad news. Or I'd get a call, a teacher, my mom was a teacher, so a teacher would call my mom and go, you know who he's hanging out with? And I would get that whole old-fashioned you know, telephone thing, I'm hanging out with the wrong people. Well, digitally online, when people engage with your social media, or they see that collaborative partnership, and you may not know that this person has any type of reputation or name attached to them, the minute they engage and they become part of your brand, which is what's happening, you need to be aware if it's good or bad people that are engaged, you know, engaging with you. So it's super important. So like I was saying, as you build this team of people that you're collaborating with to elevate your influence, make sure you're looking at who those people are and make sure they're good, credible people. Three pages deep. And so we also say at the first of the month, just like, what else do you do at the first of the month? Shout it out. What do you do? Pay bills? Pay mortgage? Anybody change filters? I do. All my filters first of the month, or I'll forget. <laughs> Google yourself. First of the month, put it in your calendar. So there's always a first of every month. There's not always a, t there's not always a 31st, but there's always a first. Just put... Google us, Google our name, Google our name. So just put that in there and set those Google alerts so you're aware of how you look online. Because what happens is, I put on here 82% of referrals bounce. So you could be working hard, you could be developing thought leadership content, you could be amazing. We actually have, true story, I think I wrote about this in my book, we had somebody come to us that was $4 million contract. Both companies had a great group of people, great group of people, great offering. It was neck and neck. The founders of both companies had an inside track to the $4 million contract. But then what they decided to do is they began to Google the team. And they looked at the team to see who was most consistent with the qualifications that they touted about in the proposal. One company was clean, the other was not. The other was not, $4 million. Now, a lot of us don't have the opportunity to work on deals that big, but you don't know what referrals you're not getting because a lot of times people are not going or they'll go, did you get that referral from me? And it's so far gone, it's late. But if 82% are bouncing, this is an opportunity for each and every one of you to get all those other bounced referrals to be that person that's super clear, super credible, and your entire team looks good. And you look good online. So again, that's the awareness check. If you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see this article 
one of the top two articles. Okay, your brand story. So there's the person story, the people story, the founder story. How many people in here are founders? Raise your hand. You online. So with the founder story, this is the passion, the blood, sweat, and tears, whatever it was that drove the person to start the company. Then we begin to allow the employee advocates to come online. And so a lot of times we cut them loose or we're just happy they're willing to share content or we'll get excited because a customer will give us a testimonial. But a lot of times we don't get into teaching people how to properly tell their story. So that's us, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the people that are involved around us. So make sure that, and you know, you can Google this, you don't have to do it through us, but make sure you understand the art of storytelling. Because when you can get your brand, your organization, and your people trained in storytelling, it's a tipping point. Because people love to hear stories. They engage and connect with brands because of the stories. In fact, Mary Rodriguez, you know Mary, Mary Rodriguez, she's actually uh, been here at Dream Bank from Microsoft. She started off as the social media person at Microsoft. Pretty big shoes to fill. She is now the head of storytelling for Microsoft. So I worked with her uh, a couple of years ago and we were brainstorming and she's like, I have this mandate that they want to humanize the brand and have us tell more stories. So as we were going back and forth and talking about it, they actually took the people that make Microsoft Word, Excel, Office, many of us use those tools, taught them how to tell their story. They humanized the brand and connected people to the brand, not because of the big Microsoft name or Bill Gates or anything like that. It was about the connection of the people behind the software, behind the brand. <clears throat> so I, um, I was actually uh, in town here. Uh, AmFam was nice enough to put me up at the Indigo Hotel right next door. Brand new. Well, they said it's the newest hotel in the city. I had probably the best salmon dinner that I've had in a long time, and I travel all over the world. So I had to make a point to talk to the chef, uh, to, to just let them know that they were, this was spot on. I can't believe I've traveled all over the world and all I had to do was come to Madison to the Indigo Hotel to have the best salmon I've ever tasted. But it had me think that I think, and maybe, maybe I noticed it because of restaurants or things like that, but that Food Network and chefs were one of the first. You guys remember Emeril when he first started out? And even before that, there was Julia Childs. And there was different people that were the chef that sort of came to the forefront. And people went to the restaurant because of the chef. Some people, heck, went to our restaurant because of their favorite bartender was there. Now, they might have been giving them some free drinks. Maybe that was a thing. But the idea here is, is the connection to the people. So if you can help your people in the back really begin to tell those stories, it activates the brand that it's approachable, it's human, it's not this digital place they go to, to open a ticket or to buy a thing. It now really makes it go to that next level. So you want to teach storytelling so that the people that do go online on your behalf understand that it's a conversation, that they have a story to tell, Make sure their profiles really tell the best parts about their story. Sometimes we don't just want skills and experience. We want a connection, a likability factor. So just like when I talked about Purdue and the Badgers, when I watch the Badgers and they're not playing for Purdue, I root for the Badgers because a bunch of my friends went to school here. Their kids go to school here. So there's that, there's that connection of like alumni and, and just, you know, sports and things like that. That's how I connect. So I also, 
play the drums any, not well anymore, but any other musicians in the room? What do you play? Piano, guitar? Yeah, guitar and bass. What do you play? Nothing? You sing, don't you? No, you won't sing. <laughs> I'm not calling on you to sing. Um, so the interesting thing is, as we connect or we meet somebody or we're at a networking event, we, we begin to engage. And we've studied this with all kinds of groups, all kinds of rooms. When we reach that moment that we're done introducing what we do and we really get down to what matters and who we are and maybe telling a little bit of our story, it's that moment that the human connection process happens. It's the mo moment that the neurons are firing in our brains and really connecting us to a whole new level. And so what's interesting is why don't we talk about those things first? What do you like to do? What do you like to do when you're not working? What do you do for fun? And so those are the what's funny is when we begin to add those, you'll notice if we work with anybody out there, even on their LinkedIn profile, we put the personal, the human element, even in the profiles on the website, of what they like to do, what they love to do when they're not working. We, we make those humans more human, not just professionals. So think of that, about that on behalf of your brand. Are you human enough? Are they telling a story to help your brand tell a humanized story? So that's number three. Four, now it's time to activate it. So it'll be, uh, especially in the early days, people would hire us to do LinkedIn profiles and things like that. And then we, because we were in the reputation business, we would Google and we'd say, you have 11 profiles on social media. What do you mean? On LinkedIn? No. You have MySpace, Class Reunion. They have all these sites where they've built and they've partially started telling who they are. So make sure that when you define or tell your story, make sure you're consistent. Make sure you're authentic. Make sure it feels approachable. And remember that team I was talking about early on? A good team member or a good partner tells you the truth. You know that person that says you still have a piece of broccoli in your teeth? Those people that are willing to be honest with you and tell you the truth, go to them. Have them read your profile. Have them read your story online. Does it feel genuine, authentic? Does it feel approachable? Would they want to talk to you? Those people will tell you the truth. And you know what's interesting about the exercise? When you start asking more people to really help you with your story, it actually, the process alone generates more referrals. Just the act of beginning to tell your story with others and get their feedback and input really begins to generate more business and referrals, just that act alone. So as we have people listed out, and we have people go out and we'll say, okay, here's the story. Now what we want you to do is really sit down with, you know, five, six, seven of these people and tell that story. And they get scared a little bit when they go to do that because it's new, it's fresh. So start with the people that are the nicest and the closest. But remember to include people that really tell you the truth. Now, as you look at this, that digital footprint really is, takes place in many areas. So some people like to be, uh, you know, we put a lot of our professional profile in LinkedIn, who we are, we tell our story. And then we go into Facebook, and Facebook, I don't know if many of you know, has your entire available work history in there. And so what a lot of times people did is they started to fill out that work history, and then they decided, no, I'm going to put it all in LinkedIn. But when you Google your name, the second thing that pops up under any named websites or LinkedIn is your Facebook story. So again, make sure you look at all your profiles. Are you a consistent professional and a consistent human being in your definition of who you are? So if you update, you know, make sure that if you're updating your profile, and we recommend that you check it quarterly, 
So whether it's the business profile or it's the human profiles, the professional profiles, make sure you check those quarterly. And then when you make any changes, just don't forget to replicate it wherever else you exist. The other thing that is often overlooked is that people do not check the website. So the website must match whatever the profiles say online. And then the proposals or any, any type of content that's written needs to match as well. So usually having a good checklist of making sure that if you update things related to the brand, you, you, you update things related to the human side of the brand, make sure you make those consistent. Now we talk about activating the network. So we have the advocates and the influencers. So I like to think about um, all the people that we do business with. Now, my accountants and attorneys are a little more shy out there. It's a little tough to get them to be online advocates, but they might do a testimonial, they might do some level of content. So some ideas about how to activate your network. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you blog. I don't know how many of you maybe involve yourself with podcasts or any type of video, but some of the easiest things to do is to actually take and interview someone to determine these partners that you have to determine their thoughts, to help them with their thought leadership. And you, by doing that and just writing a small blog post with two, three, four people, just explodes. I don't know if you guys have heard Andy uh, Crest Crestadina talk. He talks about this in his books, but he talks about collaborative blogging collaboration online. And if you can begin to add one, two, three, four people to that next video conversation, the next mentions and their thought leadership, not just thinking about what experts we are, but helping those people, it really just takes it to that next level. And it shows that you're collaborative. It shows you're willing to partner. So think about the power in this. So you have your organization, which has a brand, you have the employees, and not all employees are, you know, eligible for activation. And there might be some that, it, it needs to be okay with them and their idea. You have ideal clients. Obviously, you want to make sure good relationship, good clients, make sure it works, uh, make sure that they understand it. And maybe there's even an opportunity as you begin to learn more about this, is to help them with some of the things that you learn with things you can advise them on. So just even some of the simple things that we talked about today, maybe there's ways that as you're collaborating, you can recognize, hey, did you ever think about putting more of yourself or, or the human element of who you are with your people on the website? Did you ever think about updating your LinkedIn profile? So as you learn these things and these techniques and these tricks, make sure as a thought leader you're also Thought leaders also empower others. So make sure you do that. And then we have suppliers and partnerships. And when we activate it, again, it's usually around the content. Now you don't have to author content for this to work, but maybe you have customers, clients, partners, suppliers that author thought leadership content that maybe you could easily share and tag them in posts. And that can be a collaborative move without you doing a whole lot of work but it's about you being aware that they have this content out there. So again, as you're picking and selecting people to be on your team, make sure that you look at the content that they're putting out there and engage with it and activate it with them and then start to develop partnerships to generate content together. So uh, I have the uh, detailed version of this if you wanna get this, but I put this up here because you need to have a good content plan. What are some of the good components of a content plan? What are the goals, just like we started with? Who's the target that we're talking to? Making sure that we're all having a conversation with the same, the right person, right? So think of the target. Um, think about uh, ideal content. How, what are those targets consuming? Just like I said before. And again, I can give you a, a print out of this. But you want to understand also, 
when you're talking with people or you're generating content, we find that different audiences consume different content. So sometimes, you know, you'll have three maybe disciplines, three <laughs> product lines, three areas of business. You talk to people that are involved with hardware different than software. Those are different conversations. So you have to be aware of that as you're beginning to generate content. Now, the thing that we do here is the Monday through Sunday calendar by channel. So we determine that social media and marketing has a role in putting brand content out there. But then also we wanna welcome and invite participants that are on our team to also play in that content. So we want to actually have, uh, we wanna have a plan that says that they know that we're putting out certain things on Mondays, certain things on Tuesdays, certain things on Wednesdays. Um, you heard uh, Jake talk about different uh, programs that they have here about on different days of the month or different times of the month or days of the week. So we wanna programmatically just really let our participants, our audience, our people know when we're doing things. And so that's the easiest thing. When we go into organizations, sometimes we're just giving them a calendar so they know exactly when things are going out and when things are going on. So sometimes you don't have to work that hard and you don't have to get so elaborate on content calendars. You just really have to educate the people that are part of that network to make sure that they are involved in the storytelling, the loop, the sharing of everything, and make sure that it works together. So make sure you do that, okay? So in that, and then usually we do it by platform. So depending on the platforms, uh, some people have um, organizational platforms. I have uh, some technology groups and some different forums that might maintain groups. They might maintain other private platforms that they're building community in. So again, make sure you include all those as part of your <clears throat> what do we normally train in when we're really getting the organization to really be an influencer-driven organization? So I highlighted some of these for you. Storytelling, which I named. Social teaming, working together online, making sure that people participate together. Content marketing. So if we think about content marketing in its simplest form, it has to be consumed. So we have to teach people that are, if we're allowing them to do user-generated content of any type, and when we walk in, sometimes this is happening in silos. We have customer and onboarding folks, we have customer service folks, and, and most of the organizations that we, that we uh, walk into even have different email systems sometimes, and they're communicating different messages out there, and we're really confusing people when we do that. So make sure you teach about content marketing and really the art of engagement. So we think about being conversational, inviting people back to talk with us. So let's make sure we do that. Uh, social selling is usually on the conversion side. I don't know how that applies. And making sure we measure the metrics and the KPIs. The things in the beginning that we agreed to measure, let's make sure we commit to uh, training folks on that. So when we launch and measure step eight, we wanna make sure that we're always measuring against what we committed to set our goals with. So if it's leads, if it's referrals, if it's generating revenue, which it should be for most of us, make sure you tie it back to all of your efforts. Make sure you're measuring to the bottom line. That's the only way you're gonna increase revenue. So think about that now. Uh, what's interesting about this is we started with the business goals. So again, keep them simple at first, keep them measurable, make sure they're easy to get to, make sure the whole team is aligned. The awareness check. What do we look like online right now? What's our current state? Is it good or is there an inventory of things to fix? The people that we're empowering around us. They look, they're connected to our brand, are they okay too? So make sure we have that awareness check. Be able to tell your brand story. So that could be your personal brand story for those of you that are founders and sole practitioners. 
for you of you that, that manage brands, it could be your brand story. And for the people within the organization, make sure we help them tell their story. Build a new updated footprint, right? Make sure that that new footprint, that with the new updated stories, all look good. And what's fun is we'll do this in a workshop environment where we have the employees sitting around and we're doing this together, helping each other out, critique each other, help each other find things online. Activate and build your network, right? So you have that team, make sure you activate and build that network. Get your content map going. Make sure that you provide training and coaching. Make sure you launch and measure. Now, what I'm going to move into next is I have a small case study. So in the, con in the content marketing world, digital marketing world, we talk a lot about what's called the loyalty loop. How can we get people to not just come through the door, but to keep coming back and bring people with them? called the Loyalty Loop. This has been around now for at least a decade, and it still works. But I'll tell you, when you activate the humans, the content, and you really get it all working together, synergistically with the storytelling, it happens at a lower cost and on a more frequent basis. So really what you're really trying to do is take people from consideration that when they're ready to make a decision and they need their computer repaired, they're thinking of you. They need an installation, they're thinking of you. Anything related to their computer, even if you don't do it, they're thinking of you. So that's where, you, that's where we want to get to. We want to be the first one they think of and they call. So we had this community bank. Now here's what's funny. Brand new bank was taken over in Chicago, small bank, and we had uh, Jim, who just turned 70, Tom Meyer, who just turned uh, 54, had the strongest LinkedIn network, and they were, the, they were the most active on social media. So two of the oldest participants did, have, had the most accurate. Then we had other officers of the bank, people involved with the bank, that they were all over the place. Their networks were all, you know, varied backgrounds and, and just all over the place. And these guys were super solid. So all we did is we looked at the, the organization and we said, well, let's fix it from the inside out. Who engages with customers? We just took the customer engaging people and started with that small team. At the time, it was five. We made sure their profiles were consistent, help them tell their story, make sure their other social media was all looking good, make sure they were all spruced up. And what we did is we be began to go to the outside. We began to activate the customers, the people at the teller window. Oh my gosh, they wanted to do Instagram. I was like, a bank doing Instagram? Really? And it took off like crazy. So we started to really getting those loyal customers, acknowledging employees, and really just taking it slow. And it literally took about a year and a half. Banks move slow. Financial institutions, they want to be cautious, they move slow. So we just took it one person at a time. Now we have a lineup of two customers being interviewed every month. We do featured press releases and case studies, two a month, of success stories with their customers. To the point where the community is so activated, there's, there is still a single location bank. And online, they're kicking the butt of all the other multi-location banks around them. And Chicago is a very bank competitive market. It's a heavy competitive market. And for them to be one of the number one commercial lenders is huge. It's huge just from that little bit of activation. Then all of a sudden, as we started posting more on them, they started getting actually picked up in the news. 
And now all of a sudden, it automatically elevated them with the content, the profiles, and the things that we put out there in the internet without advertising. They became one of the top search results for commercial SBA lending, small business lending. Just content and people activation. To the point that we've had them for three years now, they just started to run ads. They just now started to run ads. So pretty good. And uh, we actually did this other thing too where they sponsor a lot of events, more business events. We started to activate more interviews on the events, featuring people, things like that, and externalizing those events for them, just at a very small scale. Pictures, a little bit of video, nothing over the top budget, but just again, activating all those people that they're talking to. Then we went one step further. We started acknowledging businesses in the community that weren't customers you're like, why would you do that? Because they had highlights. They were worth recognizing. It was a new expansion in town. And just for the simple fact that they just didn't talk about themselves and their customers, but they acknowledged others in the community, really made them approachable, really brought them to a whole new level of being human, not just a bank. Now, they still just went and got a new fancy mobile app. We all love those. And I don't know the last time you went into the bank, like stepped into it. But I'll tell you what, we get some of the best engagement for the least amount of cost out of those banking folks from that location than we do even with some of our hospitality folks and other people that we work with. So think of the power for a bank to be activated at that level. So um, deposits increased, commercial loans increased, um, email lists grew by four times in six months. Their email opt-in list, four times. They went from 1,000 to 4,000 within six months just by activating. So every month we have this leaderboard where we show them who got the most engagement and we do this uh, meeting with them twice a month and all of them, except for the CFO, we still can't get him to move. The CFO will not go online, but he pays for it, so it's okay. But the idea is we get them to fight over wanting to be the most engaged banker on LinkedIn. Imagine that. Bankers fighting over social media. It's like unprecedented. So, so if they can do it, just think of the power that you, each and every one of you have. 